Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by one of my co-hosts, uh, Chris Dorides. Chris, how are you? Doing well, thanks, Mark. How are you? What's the deal? Ryan has uh, bailed on us. Uh, Ryan Sweet's the other co-host, and uh, he, I, I think, a lot of stuff going on at home today, so we'll miss I blame the, uh I blame the yield curve. You right. do? Why? Yeah, it's narrowing. He's not a big believer in the yield curve. I, I... I think oh, it's just think avoiding the uh, off, do you? yeah, avoiding the issue. So. Uh, I don't. I, that see. doesn't sound like Ryan. <laughs> stuff doesn't scare no, Ryan off. No. Yeah, I, I think. He, yeah, I think he's actually more scared about that. The the bet we have on housing starts, which we're definitely going to come back to, Chris, Mister Dorit. Oh yeah, Dr. yeah you Dorit. should be. You should be scared. No. Oh, uh, 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 we had a great number. Uh, uh, okay, we'll come back to that. We'll come back. Uh, yeah. And I should say, uh, Chris obviously is the deputy chief economist, but we've got two uh, guests today, uh, Ivy Zellman and Dennis McGill, and uh, we'll come back and introduce the two of them shortly. Uh, we go way back with both. Uh, I'm going to ask Ivy how many years back we go, but we go back a lot of years, so it's good to have them on. And they are the very best on housing, housing finance, and other than you, Chris, I should say, you're, you're pretty good yourself. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you're, you're, I'm you're a big IE fan. A we're, lot of the time, we're aligned in our forecast. So yeah, right, exactly. a lot, lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Okay. Uh, but before we go down the housing path, I think it's apropos, uh, obviously they're related. The Fed met this past week, uh, the FOMC meeting, a big meeting. Uh, maybe you could give us a sense of how you think that meeting went. Uh, what's the story in that meeting? Chris? Yeah, they, they had a lot to say. So uh, just to summarize, so the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, met on Wednesday and raised the target Fed funds rate by 25 basis points to a range of 25 to 50 basis points, right? So this is the first rate hike in uh, three years. So that is that is significant. And really, if I can summarize, we'll get into some of the details, but su a summary of the tone, they signaled essentially that they're all in in fighting inflation, that they're even willing to sacrifice growth to fight inflation. That is the, the number one most uh, pressing issue at this time. So they signal they're going to, not only do they hike now, but they're going to continue to hike according to the dot plot, which is a, a summary of all the uh, uh, members of the committee and their views on uh, where the uh, Fed funds rate and inflation and, and GDP are going to end up over the next couple of years. They're signaling um, that the Fed's funds rate would end at 1.9% by the end of this year. That's the median. So we're talking six more hikes at one at every meeting of a quarter point. So Again, fairly uh, aggressive uh, stance, large change from what we saw in December, right? So clearly they are concerned about uh, inflation. They also indicated that they do expect to reduce their balance sheet in coming months. They, they didn't specify when exactly that will be, but uh, I would imagine it's gonna be within the next one, three months would be my guess that they'll start to reduce some of the uh, holdings that they have in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. They just stopped purchasing what, a couple of weeks ago, so now right. they're going to, to switch gears here. Uh, what else did they have to have? To, they did mention the uh, uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, by Russia as being certainly a human tragedy, uh, economic uh, uh, concern as well, injecting a large degree of uh, uncertainty into the U.S. economic outlook. So clearly, that's something that they're watching, and it might be a reason why they're taking this certainly um, wait and see approach. They're not going to commit to anything just yet in terms of a very aggressive uh, monetary policy because there are these cross currents uh, when it comes to inflation, growth, oil prices, so any number of factors here. Um, one, uh, one last thing, I'll just summarize the economic projections yeah. that they gave because there was a, a fairly significant revision uh, to their outlook here. Uh, they cut their GDP forecast for 2022 to 2.8% from 4%. So that's pretty significant. Uh, that is, they had forecasted 4% at the last meeting uh, back in December. And there was um, no significant, no real significant change to the unemployment rate outlook, though. So they still see a very strong labor market. Uh, it's really just this uh, reduction in growth. And then perhaps the largest change or most obvious changes around their views on inflation. For 2022, they expect PC inflation to come in at around 4.3% uh, versus a uh, uh, forecast of 2.6% in December. So upgraded 
significantly the view there. And then even in 2023, they expect that inflation will still be relatively high at 2.7%. Right, so that's uh, an indication of, uh, again, yeah. their, the view that the inflation is pressing, it's gonna take some real effort uh, to get it back down. Couple things, uh, one, yeah. uh, they kind of hit it right down the fairway, didn't they, with regard to market expectations. So before the yeah. meeting, investors thought, hey, they're going to raise rates seven times this year, one at each FOMC meeting. There's seven to go, and they're going to get seven, and we'll get to 1.9% by the end of the year, and that they will give us some sense of balance sheet reduction you know, uh, sometime kind of mid-year. And I think the market reaction was first negative. Uh, you saw stock prices sell off, bond yields rise, but then by the end of the day, stock prices had fully recovered and bond yields had come right back in. So it felt like, you know, they just nailed what the market was expecting. So nothing, it was hawkish, no doubt, yeah. you know, obviously yeah. very hawkish, but that was well anticipated by market participants. Would you agree with that, that yeah. observation? Yeah, I would, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Se second, uh, our forecast is a little bit less hawkish. Uh, so let me ask you this before the Fed met, we were forecasting four rate increases in 2022, not not seven. What do you, you know, we, we're we going to do a forecast here pretty soon, you know, for the for the month of uh, April coming up a couple of weeks from now. What are you, what's your thinking around what the Fed's going to do now? Uh, and, and obviously this forecast is what the Fed will do, not necessarily yeah. what you think they should do, but, uh, you know, what will they do? Do you think is it three more rate hikes now or six more rate hikes for the remainder of the year? So that's a pretty big gap between our forecast and the market forecast and the Fed's forecast. It is. Um, my view at this point is uh, five, right? I, I, I increase it. I think there's going to be another one, but I think the, you have so many cross currents. I'm not ready to commit to a, a, a very aggressive uh, policy. And if you look at the, dot, the history of the dot plots and how accurate they were in projecting how many rate hikes the Fed actually conducted, um, at least over the last uh, five years or so, it, they've always come in uh, stronger than what actually happens, right? So dot plots indicate very aggressive policy and then what in reality the Fed is never quite able to to get up to that. And so, so you're I, saying their forecast is wrong, Chris. That's what you're saying. Oh yeah, their forecast yeah, is wrong. What they said it in a nice, like, roundabout <laughs> way, but uh, their their forecast is wrong. Well, you know, they use some language there to color it, and yeah, there's yeah, lots yeah. of uncertainty. Your, your thinking is well, data driven. They're, right, so. they're right about growth. They're right about inflation. But uh, you think inflation will moderate sufficiently enough? Growth will slow sufficiently that we need another four rate hikes this year, not another six rate hikes this year, which in the grand scheme of things, you know, you know. I don't, I'm not sure I, I would debate it, you know, thanks right. very much. Right. Uh, and also on the balance sheet, you said that they, and I think they indicated strongly that they would uh, uh, begin allowing the balance sheet to wind down. So they, they bought all these treasuries, they bought all these mortgage securities they to bring down long-term interest rates. They yep. stopped buying not too long ago, but it, but at the May meeting, the next meeting, it's likely they're going to announce that uh, they're going to now allow the, the balance sheet to run off, meaning the, 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 the securities on the balance sheet will mature. Maybe there'll be some prepayment on the mortgage securities that'll allow that to happen. And if you do the arithmetic, the balance sheet will run off by about $100 billion a month, you know, and, and that's kind of sort of, I think they were pretty point blank about that, that they were going to do that. So it sounds like that's where we're headed. Yeah, I think I don't think they gave the specifics on the timing because they want to allow themselves uh, some freedom there. But uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. reading between the lines. I think that's what they what they. Okay, good. At. This is a good point to bring in our guests because the the next part of the uh, the next logical thing to talk about is mortgage rates, and, and I'm very curious, you know, what Ivy and Dennis think about the path for mortgage rates going forward uh, in the context of what the Fed did. So let's let's Ivy. It's good to have you, Ivy Zellman. Good to see you. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, having us. How long has it been since we? How long ha have we known each other? Did, did or did, would you rather not say? Well, for both our <laughs> I think that uh, it's got to be at least twenty-five years. I think it, I think it has. I was going to say yeah. that too. Twenty-five years. Yeah. Yeah, we had the pleasure of being on uh, the uh, infamous uh, Louis Rick Rukeyser Wall Street Week show. For those that are old enough to remember, kind of the the Oprah of Wall Street back then. I don't know about you, Ivy, but I was like quaking in my boots. Were you nervous when that? When, oh, that yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it's like, yeah. And you were so good. I remember you were, you were, I remember Dennis, you, I don't know if I've ever told you, we ever talked about this, but uh, Ivy was pumping Louis Rukeyser before the show, basically wanted to know what his first question was going to be. <laughs> Do you remember this Ivy? Do you remember this? You don't remember. Oh, I so remember. Like, I remember he, I was uh, very nervous. Uh, and she was trying to figure it out and he would not tell her. He goes, nope, I'm not telling you. You got to be ready for any question that's coming. <laughs> it was so, uh, it was like the Pope. He flew, if I, if I I'm not sure, I, you know, I, I hope I'm not making this up, Ivy, but he, it was a studio somewhere in like the middle of Maryland between DC and Baltimore. And he flew in on a helicopter. He landed, he came into his office in the studio and we all would sit around and if he got his, monologue written in time we'd go live no is that right yeah we would go live and if he didn't get it written in time we no no it was the other way around if he could write it in time if we wrote it in time we would tape it and if he couldn't get it written in time we would go live right so we're all praying that he gets it done so that we could tape it <laughs> so, but no no it went live we went live and it was so, it was fun right Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. I don't know. I had the pleasure of being on more than once. And I can tell you oh. in my, in my twenties, um, lit, you know, late twenties, it was, um, you know, such an affright, frightening experience, but, um, also an incredible one. Yeah, that was, he was a good guy. Interesting fellow. So, so tell me about, you know, your path, Ivy. I mean, you have this wonderful company with all these great folks, uh, and, uh, you know, you've made such an impact on the housing and housing finance industries. You know, everywhere I go, anyone I talk to, they talk about, you know, your work and Dennis's work and the company's work. So, you know, just an amazing uh, success story. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and thank you. Uh, Dennis and I have been together, kind of glued at the hip for 22 years. And uh, prior to Dennis joining me at Credit Suisse as a summer intern, I'll steal his thunder a little, but uh, summer intern out of Michigan, um, I started working at Solomon Brothers um, in 1990. And I did a, a two-year um, investment banking um, financial analyst role and then moved into equity research. And I was fortunate because the lights were going to go out, according to everyone, because Solomon Brothers was going through a treasury scandal. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of a recession and there was openings and uh, the investment bankers were like, you don't want to go in equity research. They're just monkeys. They just write what the uh, uh, managements tell them what to write. But there was a job and I could pay my rent. So that was the beginning of my career. And I spent another eight years at Solomon Brothers as the housing analyst um, running really home building and building product research um, for that silo and then went to Credit Suisse for a decade. And that's when Dennis and I later hooked up. I was there in late 97. That was after um, Smith Barney acquired uh, Solomon Brothers and I was let go because they had the number one ranked analyst at the time. I did surpass him the following year. So that was a bad choice on that part. Um, <laughs> You, but you, then, surpassed, uh, you surpassed Dennis, you said. Surpassed the number one ranked analyst at the time that Smith Barney chose oh, and I see. hired me. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, but uh, recognizing that, you know, after um, several years at uh, Credit Suisse and the market uh, in 2000, you know, was just coming off of um, what were tech bubble-ish, you know, 2001, the housing market was benefiting at that time from the Fed easing. And the market started really becoming the darling after the tech wreck. And um, our research was, again, really uh, focused on builders and building product companies. But we, we sometimes stepped outside our lane. So that uh, was early on when Dennis joined me as an intern. And um, we started writing about the mortgage market and really continued to uh, utilize what at, at the time was a Rolodex that I developed to not rely on publicly traded management teams to inform us. So I started talking to private home builders. And fortunately, back in the early 90s, I did this at Solomon Brothers. The industry is so fragmented across really all of the pieces of the um, puzzle, the ecosystem, that you can call a private home builder or talk to a private um, mortgage company, a private real estate broker, every aspect of it, and really learn what's going on. I call it boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. So we, we really continued to build that Rolodex to help inform our, our overall outlook. And um, we turned cautious, um, really more neutral, call it late 0405 over just concerns on affordability. But 
Um, so really, I'll just summarize to not go on and on about the, what, what happened in the past about the housing market, but you know, my team, Dennis and I leading sort of the charge, it's really about deep dive thematic work and overlaying the, that work with proprietary surveys that allow us to say, are we still on track for our forecast, our longer term forecast? And each month when we're obtaining information from these C-suite executives that are partnering with us, we really could adjust and, and better um, confirm or, or you know, moderate, um, adjust our forecast. So it's really a unique business model because we really are not dependent just on data and, and economic models, but just live human beings that are, you know, I call it weeds in the trees and boots on the ground that we are really a beneficiary of that, of that partnership. And so you guys started a company, uh, uh, what, what's the, I always pronounce this wrong, uh, uh, eponymous, eponymous, it's uh, Ivy Zellman and Associates. That, did you know that word eponymous? That's you name something with your name. That's called, oh. it's called eponymous. <laughs> um, Got it. A new one for me. I know that. Yeah, we started Zellman in um, October of 07, in the beginnings of the the true storm of the the GFC. Um, and, oh wow! Good timing, guys. 07. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and it's been quite a ride. We recently yeah. sold a majority stake of the company in July of 2021 to Walker Dunlop, which is a public company, Great company. commercial um, financial lender and uh, investment sales broker. They're um, now at the at the helm and uh, we are operating pretty much autonomous, but working with them to find synergies and uh, strategize on the future. So um, it's a pretty big inflection point after you know, roughly 14 years of being independent. Yeah, excellent. Willie Walker, he, he's got his own podcast. You're gonna have to yeah. tell me, you're gonna have to let Willie know who's got the better podcast. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> yeah. But he's got a wonder, he actually does a, a really, unlike me, a lot of homework. He does a lot of homework. He, he gets- No, he's, he's a stuff. great moderator. He's a great moderator. That's a very, very good podcast. Uh, something to to really aspire to. So, so Dennis, uh, you know, Ivy, I'm, don't take uh, offense to this, but Dennis looks like he's a, you know, like he's in his, still in his twenties. Like, what the heck is going on here? Am I? I know I always say this every time I see Dennis, but it's true. Look at him. Well, yeah. I, I'd like to think I can still act like I'm in my twenties too sometimes, but <laughs> that's which good. Gets me in some that's trouble. Great. Yeah. Um, I was going to say I would take the over on the twenty-five year comment that you guys have known each other because I've known Ivy for twenty-two or something like that, and I know your stuff was was already in existence then. And I it's probably true. Went, and it was economy.com, so I'm not sure what I don't remember when that change happened, but it yeah, was still that, economy.com. That's when we sold the company. I, you know, we had our we had a company, economy.com. Uh, my brother and I, and a fellow, we started it back, you know, nineteen ninety. We yeah. sold it to Moody's. I don't know, sixteen years ago now. So, uh, but, but that. So, so Dennis, you're head of. Re pardon me. So have the domain. That must have been I a cheap still, domain yes, at the indeed? time. Oh no! Wait, hold it, hold it. I don't have the economy.com domain. No, I don't. It's the uh, Moody's owns the economy.com domain, and we okay. still use it. Actually, if you if you go www.economy.com, you'll come to one of our websites. So, so yeah. Uh, I held on to a few other. We bought a whole bunch of them. You know, like every state code plus economy. Like, <laughs> you know, paeconomy.com. I've got a few of those. If are you interested in buying those, Dennis, by any chance? I mean, everything's got a price mark. <laughs> I know that's worth about five cents on eBay, probably. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so you're director of research, and you've been with um, you were a founding member of of Zellman Associates, uh, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it was our small team from Credit Suisse. Um, yeah. Great. How big's your research team now? How many folks do you have working now at Ivy? Uh, including uh, Ivy and myself, we're at uh, twelve. Twelve, fantastic. And um, and uh, where were you prior to credit? You guys met each other at Credit Suisse. Were you? Did you come right out of school? Were you? Were you doing yeah, something so, else? So, so the internship that Ivy referenced, I was uh, actually I had already graduated from college, but was going back for a master's in accounting. So I knew that summer period was uh, really an internship type period, and. Uh, the reason I was going back for a, a, a last a year of accounting was somewhat to to build a knowledge, but also because I was totally unprepared to to come into and and get a good quality job. So it worked out well to be the naive uh, graduate going to this hybrid internship between New York and Cleveland, which is where Ivy was was working from. Um, somehow, still with a two one two 
phone number um, to kind of mask that oh, I know. transition. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was the where we we had met, and then fortunate enough to get offered a job back at Credit Suisse, and then I remember Ivy calling me and and letting me know that that would be also on her team as well. Well, fantastic! It's good to have you both. And you know, let's go back to the mortgage rate question. I'm really, you know, obviously housing housing finance very sensitive to rates. Uh, so I assume you guys have a view on where mortgage rates are headed. Uh, and so let me ask: Do you have a view on where mortgage rates are headed, and how does how did what the Fed did this past week affect your thinking about where mortgage rates are headed? If if you if you have an explicit forecast. Well, we don't have an explicit forecast, but I think okay. that with Krista's um, comments about the Fed planning on selling MBS, um, really it's a function of the pressure on, um, or I should say the lack of demand that that, that would in, imply, would, you'd assume rates would move higher. And yet also we're seeing pressure on originations, you know, significant, significant pressure on refis. So it's kind of like they'll be originating less, so there's less supply while there is less demand, but, you know, directionally, we're obviously seeing rates not only increase, but spreads are, are widening with, with pressure on the mortgage originators that, you know, are trying to deal with competitive pressures, but offsetting the fact that the primary secondary spreads continue to be challenged. So um, we're seeing year over year uh, for primary buyers, the monthly payment for an entry level buyer is up about probably 30% year over year. So certainly, that is directionally not favorable for the consumer, for the primary buyer. Despite that though, there's been um, really surprising resiliency to that. And we think that has a lot to do with the non-primary buyer in the market that, that people don't really worry about, but we, we're, we're paid worriers, Mark. <laughs> you know, that, That's what we do for a living. And we're, we're not, we don't have any skin in the game. We don't have a book of business that you know, we're tied to any view. And we just try to be insightful, but we are concerned about, you know, rising rates, but we don't forecast them. Okay, so let me unpack that for a second because I, I have been a little confused about this. So, uh, uh, the mortgage rate that people pay, you know, right now is a little over four percent. Last I looked, that's up about a percentage point from uh, where we were really not too long ago. I think you know, kind Part of, of the year. towards the end of last year, early this, <laughs> yeah. right, Chris? Yep. Uh, some of that is uh, obviously all interest rates have risen, the so-called risk-free rate, the 10-year treasury yield rate, which the mortgage rate is often is, is based off of, that has moved up. But the, as you said, the, the spread, the difference between the mortgage rate and the 10-year treasury yield has also increased over this period. And so uh, if you go back beginning of this year, the difference between the primary mortgage rate and the 10-year yield was about 150 basis points, one and a half percentage points. Now it feels like it's more like two percentage points. So it's, a, it's increased by a half a point. So what's going on there? Why is that spread gapped out like that, you know, over the past couple of months, couple, three months? Do, do you have a sense oh, of that? You know, Dennis can weigh in, but we used to use the 10 year uh, versus the 30 year spread as a proxy to understand, you know, what mortgage rates, you know, directionally would look like in competitive pressures, but it's really kind of broken down that um, typical benchmark. And that has a lot to do with the pressure that we're seeing on, on MBS prices and originators that have to sell um, those mortgages into the secondary market. So that that they're, they're, they're requiring a higher return. So that's why the spreads are widening. And I think that, you know, with the Fed, you know, obviously saying they're going to um, start not only not buying, as Chris pointed out, but they're going to be selling. Uh, we're seeing that pressure result in that widening spread. And I think it was over 200. It's like a 206 basis points the last I looked, the oh, 10 to right? 30. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know, Dennis, it if you want to add a, It gets a little outside of our, our yeah. sort of sweet spot, Mark, but I think it has a lot to do with the Fed policy around. Uh, they were the, the incremental buyer for quite a long period of time right. and just not even being a buyer anymore. Sort of it, the market was trying to get ahead of that as well in anticipation of knowing that they would be exiting the market, demanding that price. Uh, premium earlier, and then now to the degree they become a seller, I think that's got people, you know, expecting that spreads are going to at least stay elevated at these levels, if not potentially pressure it further. Good point. One so, offset, so if I may just add, sure. one offset that may help a bit to the consumer is that, you know, during the, um, you know, post shutdown pandemic period, really the best credits were being underwritten and 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 purchasing homes or refining. 
and and it wasn't because they weren't willing to lend to less credit worthy buyer, buyer borrowers but today they are seeing more easing or willing to do a little bit more to bring in those lower credit borrowers today and not you know a subprime type borrowers but just on the margin and you're seeing um, in our mortgage proprietary survey that we do monthly we're seeing slight easing non-QM as well as jumbo and lower FICO scores on conventional FHA, VA. So that's starting to happen as the market's more competitive. Got it. So just to summarize for the listener, so uh, what, we're, what you're saying is, and it makes sense to me, is that, okay, the Fed was buying all these mortgage securities uh, back in the pandemic, trying to get mortgage rates down. Now the economy's strong. They're going to start tightening policy, which means they're not only not buying mortgage securities, they're allowing them to prepay, they may even start to sell at some point. I, they don't think they've gone that far yet, but they may do that. That's caused this. That's a. That's one of the factors causing this difference between mortgage rates and treasury yields to kind of widen out. But I mean, what you're pointing out is, hey, look, because interest rates are up, and we're going to come back to demand in, uh, for housing in a bit. But because demand is now suffering pr primarily by first-time buyers and, and primary buyers. Given the competition in the origination market, that might cause the at least it limit the increase in the spread, or might even bring it in at some point. You know, that's kind of sort of what you're arguing. Or, or the other way of thinking about that too. On the last point is remember the the rate is more of the the price dynamic. But I think what Ivy was getting to, and what will become incrementally more important, is what are the terms? What are the other yeah. metrics that are going into that to I'm where? Sorry. You could go to the consumer and A, you'll probably see a lot of buy downs more so going forward, whether that's a builder buy down or even a homeowners could potentially be doing it. But you could also see a different mix of product um, rate might be higher, but down payment flexibility, credit score flexibility, those types of things you're starting to see more of as the industry, like any other industry, doesn't want to shrink volume. So they're yeah. going to do what they can to try to drive volume um, in as a controlled way as possible, I guess. Oh, okay. So Ivy, you weren't really talking about the interest rate. You were and really also, talking about underwriting, the underwriting statement. Yeah, I was yeah. Yeah, I was talking about the underwriting stringency, which is what we measure. But I think as Chris would know, Fannie and Freddie actually went on the call it um jumbo second home um buyers actually tightened and increased the 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 cost for those um loans. So, you know, you've got that dynamic that's it's moderately starting to impact second home demand that we're seeing showing up, but still elevated. Got it. Got it. Okay. Let's, uh, before we move in, in deep, deeper into the housing mortgage markets, let's play our statistics game. And mm -hmm. uh, just to remind everybody out there, the game is uh, each of us, and you guys can play or not play. It's up to you. Uh, you know, love to have you, uh, but you don't need to. So don't. You just want us to sit here, Mark. We can't play the game. I don't. No, I. I would much prefer if you played, but you know, it's okay. I'm. You know, I'm giving you a way out if you want to uh, get out of this. Um, <laughs> the because you, you should know, I. I always win. I just. I, I always. Win. No, no, only kidding. Uh, Ryan's actually the big winner here. So maybe I will win. You, today you got a chance. Not you here. got a chance. <laughs> uh, so the game is we each. Uh, announce a statistic. Uh, the rest of us try to figure out what that is. The best statistic is one that is not, you know, too easy so that we all know it right away. One that's not so hard that it's like, you know, forget it. We're never going to get it. And it would be bonus is if it's somewhat related to what we're talking about, you know, housing, housing finance, or the recent, recently what's going on in the world. You know, we could talk about the, you know, it could be statistic related to the Fed or or to you know anything in the economic statistics over the last week, something like that. So with that as a uh, description, I'm going to turn just because Chris knows this game well. I'm going to go to Chris first. Chris, what's your statistic of the week? All right, nice round number seventy. Seventy. Okay. Seven zero. Um, I'll guess on that one. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Seventy percent of homeowners are locked in below four. Ooh. Well, that might be right, but that's that might not be the, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not the number I'm thinking of. But it, 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 Abby, is that right though? Seventy percent of people with mortgages have a coupon, uh, uh, a rate that's below four percent. Right. All right. Oh. Whoa. Well, before Damn, we... I thought I thought I that's had a it. that's a really that's good, good one. Line. But yeah. Before we go play though, that's a really good, interesting statistic. So, Ivy, why is that? Why? What was the import of that of that number? What is what's the well, significance? Of you know, that? I think that the Fed policy of uh, you know pumping liquidity in the market and buying MBS, the backlash of a refi boom, is going to um, 
be an impediment to um, mobility. Consumers will, you know, be disincentivized to move unless they have the arbitrage, which is what most people are focused on as those that are leaving high cost states to um, moving to low cost states, whether you're leaving the state of California and you go to Arizona, mountain states, Texas, but we're, we're watching that very closely. And just to give you some perspective, that number at the end of 18 was 39%. Oh my goodness. And so now with mortgage rates above four and 70% of mortgages have rates below four, you're saying uh, it's going to really interest rate lock. It's going to make it difficult or make it less likely people are going to move because they'll get a mortgage. Right, because mortgage rate, rate, mortgages aren't transferable with, with the exception of FHA, yeah. VA, which we don't really see a lot of that. Um, but that's at least on the conventional jumbo side, they're not transferable. Assumable. And I guess that's also why refi activity is completely dead now, right? Because- Well, we see cash out refi. Cash out. There's okay. that, you know, there's so much equity, but I don't know, Dennis, any guess on the 70 or Mark? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it related to housing, Chris? It we is, can ask it questions, is. guys. Yes. We can ask questions. It we is. can pop them. No, it's not. It, it is related to housing. So it's consistent with your rules. <laughs> well, why are you saying it that way? You're just kind of being a little sly when you answer that question. Is no, it related no, to housing? Or it not? is related to housing. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. <laughs> your your projection it, for home ownership rate? Oh, geez, that would be pretty aggressive. No. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be well, optimistic. It's, yeah. it's a number that came out this week. Number. What's that? NAHB survey. Yes, NAHB survey. Which one? Which, the which? Uh, builder sentiment survey. The the buyer sentiment survey. That one. Uh, expected sales in the expected next six sales. months. Uh, that's, that's it. That's, that's it. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. That was so, pretty good. That so was tell good. us about that. Tell us about that survey because I don't think we've ever talked about it. And what's it say? Right. So it's a uh, survey conducted by the National Association of Home Builders and Wells Fargo uh, jointly. They sent out a survey to home builders and asked them various questions about the state of the housing market, what how, how builders feel uh, about the market. One of the questions is around expected sales activity. What do you think? How how are sales going to be in the next within the next six months? Seventy was the number for March. That's down ten points from February, which was at eighty, and it's now the this level at seventy. It's the lowest since uh, June of twenty twenty. Hmm. Right. So and it's below what we had prior to the pandemic as well. So that's consistent with higher rates. You know, people being more cautious here. Uh, so does suggest that sales are going to be slowing uh, going forward. So that sounds pretty ominous then, down 10 points. Is that, are you, you know, that's future sales, right? They're saying future sales yeah. are going to be- Well, you know, the interesting part about that for me, Chris, is that a lot of times the builder survey, when it comes out, there'll be some attached commentary. And I think there's only three general questions I could ask. How do you that's feel right. about current sales, future sales, and traffic? And it's a literally a good, fair, poor multiple choice answer. And then they create the diffusion index out of that. Um, you'll see a lot of times when that goes down, sales activity goes down, they'll say, well, why? And say, well, we're worried about supply chain. We're worried about lumber costs. We're worried about these other things. Usually the reason is it doesn't have anything to do with sales, um, which is kind of the comical part. And mm -hmm. with this decline, what a lot of builders are doing today is uh, holding product off market um, because they don't know what their future costs are going to be. They're worried about the supply chain and they're still starting the homes. They're accumulating more spec and under the premise that eventually the supply chain will open up as we get closer to those homes being completed, we'll know better how to price them and then we'll release them to the consumer. And a lot of the industry is doing this. Uh, the majority of the industry is doing this. So in, in some respects, if you asked any builder about, well, what's your outlook for future sales? You sure as hell would hope that it's really good because there's a lot of spec homes coming, um, but yet the answer is uh, to headed the other direction, which is a bit ironic based on their activity around specs. You know, uh, Chris, uh, I, I think he knows a lot about these statistics. We gotta be careful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like he likes, knows a lot more than we do, which yeah. is, a, I guess, a, a good thing, a good thing. Um, so, so, Dennis, so what's your sense of that? I mean, is, and I know this is what makes looking at the housing market now feel like Alice in Wonderland. Is it demand or supply, you know, or is it both that's really now starting to weigh on sales? We saw existing home sales today. I hope that was nobody's statistic, but that was kind of on the soft side, at least relative yeah. to expectations. I, I think we all thought they were going to be lower, but it felt a little lower than I thought. So it feels like demand, well, 
in a traditional time, you say that's demand. Demand is weak. Mortgage rates are up. Demand is weakening. But it kind of feels like you're saying, well, yeah, that may be the true, but there's also the supply side issues as well. Is that kind of what you're saying? And, and there's no doubt that the supply side issue is real. The conversion rate out of backlog, how quickly yeah. builders are completing homes, we're seeing that under a lot of pressure and probably starting to maybe stabilize a little bit, not getting incrementally worse, but it's at an extended cycle time. Um, but what you're seeing is um, it complicates the read on the market because if you're a builder that's holding product off market, what you're doing to, to essentially accomplish that is raise price. And there's enough, there are enough buyers, whether they be primary or investors, to accept that price. And, and one of the dynamics you saw last cycle, which you worry a little bit about right now, is if you're signing a contract for X price on that new home and they're telling you it's not going to get billed for eight, nine, 10 months and your deposit's only 2%, 3%, whatever it might be, and it's refundable in some states, it's not a lot of risk at the at the signing period. It's almost an option contract that's pretty attractively priced. So no one's going to back away from, from these contracts. Now they'll just sit and wait because there's been so much appreciation. It's not until you get to some type of inflection point that that could create some risk. Um, but I think it challenges the notion that anyone really knows how deep the demand is right now because it's not being tested in many ways. And the hope and the, and the premise that most of the industry is operating under is that it'll be there when we're ready for it. End of this year, next year, when these homes come to market, the demand is so deep. And as you mentioned, we'll get into some of these bigger picture themes, but the idea is we're so underbuilt, the demand's so deep. When we release it, the buyer will be there. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, yeah, the cycle times, just to put in perspective, are about two months longer than historically. And, and there we had Lennar report earnings and sequentially they did see an uptick in that um, cycle time, but running year over year about two months longer. So it takes them 100 days, 120 days, it's, it's add another 60 days. And the cap, we, so what we do a proprietary home building survey <clears throat> that equates to about 15 plus percent of new home sales. And um, the publics represent 45% of the new home market. And combined, you know, they're probably limiting sales in more than half of their communities. Um, and in some builders' cases, they're not even selling right now. So there, there's really, um, we'll call it a, a supply chain, not only on the materials and getting the labor, but it's also getting the land developed. And it's at the municipality level. And it's a lack of staffing. It's, uh, it, it's problematic across the board. So it's resulting in is a lack of growth. So on the insatiable demand, it's great, but it's not great if you can't deliver people their homes and can't open new communities. So the industry is very, very challenged right now. Well, it sounds also like you're saying that uh, if you look down the road here, six, 12 months, and let's just say mortgage rates do push up to say four and a half percent, closer to five, affordability becomes a really a big, much bigger deal uh, for the primary buyer, the first time buyer. You're saying there is a, it felt like what you were saying is that you've got all these properties that or con essentially contingent sales that could fall off pretty quickly here. And so you could be left six, 12 months from now with kind of a, a hole in the market, which might mean lower house prices, for example. Is that, am I reading too much into what you said or is that? No, I, I think that is a concern. I think yeah. that at the same time, you know, I hosted um, a round table in Phoenix uh, a week and a half ago and probably 30 executives and the mortgage commentary was like, we have to underwrite people, re-underwrite them every day that are in backlog. And, and we're, you know, in this frenzy of concern that will they be able to, you know, continue to qualify. So as you think about that backlog and assuming they're primary buyers, they're not that worried right now to Dennis's point because there's been so much home price appreciation. So they're kind of in the money. Um, the question is, you know, will they be able to meet the terms of the loan um, on the new basis. And, and so that there may be some fallout there, but the builders are somewhat complacent about it. And I, we were talking about interest rate locks about, you know, can you lock in? And one lender is offering a 360 day lock, which is sort of an innovative product. Typically you can lock in 45, 60 days prior to close. And there's a product now 180 day lock. And that costs about a point and a half. And so when you think up front, what the consumer is willing to do with a lock that could mitigate the risk that if rates were to your point, go to four and a half, they could right now lock 
if they want to, but it's at a price. Got it. I think, Mark, for a lot of when we when we we started talking about mortgage rates and how we we look at it, we certainly we don't forecast. So we think more about the spread dynamic and how does that compound what the forward yield curve is implying and so forth. Um, but we always come back to the idea that the relative move in mortgage rates is a massive factor for the market. And whether you talk about it as a spread for what people have to what's outstanding and when that's in their favor, it triggers refi activity, and movement activity, or you think about it from an affordability standpoint, you get a hundred basis point drop in rates. That's like getting a 12% cut in price on the house. So the idea that that um, was hugely beneficial over the last couple of years to argue otherwise would be a little insane. And to think that it reverses and won't have some negative consequences is, is a bit comical. And you, you, you can look at it many different ways, but the correlations are very, very strong when you look at it versus sales space, whether it's exi existing homes or new homes. What's bridged that gap in, in some periods in an unhealthy way is, well, you have to start stepping in with other things, different mortgage products, uh, which is what we saw last time as people chase the market, or you have the investor buyer steps in because they're not as price sensitive as the affordable, as a, the entry level primary buyer is. Um, but how can we sit here and say that home price, the cost of a monthly payment, right? That's the cost almost every entry level homeowner is going to be thinking about their purchase in. If that's up 30% and has risk of going up more, we know incomes aren't up that much. We know people weren't sitting on a huge war chest of savings prior to the pandemic. So how does it not worry people? I, I'm with you. I mean, I totally, I'm totally with you. I mean, I, I have my know, sense. Well, Senses that rates have come down. They came down during the pandemic. You had these supply constraints, so the increase in demand from the lower rates bumped it up against no supply, and you get prices going north, skyward. Yeah. In a sense, the lower rates got capitalized in the higher house price. Exactly. But now, if demand goes away because more rates are up, and they're up, they could be up a lot. Then that's got to come out of house price, right? You know. Yeah. That's kind of what you're arguing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I was so just going to ask you this, though, Ivy. Why? Okay. So our forecast, and I think your forecast, because I'm a careful consumer of what you guys say, is not too dissimilar. You're saying, you know, house price growth has been sizzling. You know, right now I think it's 20 percent, 15, 20 percent year over year, depending on which house price you measure, you use. But we're all saying like a year from now, it, it, you know, two years from now, it slows kind of gracefully, maybe we get no house price growth for a while, but we don't, nobody is saying house price decline. Do I, did I mischaracterize your expectation? Is that roughly your forecast that house prices are going to be, they're going to go flattish maybe, but they're not going to decline, at least not nationwide. Is that roughly right? Well, right now we're in the middle of updating our forecast. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot of moving parts, but we had been, um, our last quarterly update was for 2022 to be up 4% for existing home prices. Um, I 2022. think 2023, 22 okay. and 23 is kind of oh, flat. Okay. okay. But, but I think what, you know, countering, I was just with a lot of institutional investors meeting with um, industry executives. And I think that what we hear from them and that complacency slash maybe more optimistic view that you can sort of counter the, rising rates as a risk is the the biggest one, which I'll let my in-house demographer speak to, Mr. McGill, um, who has uh, incredible brainiac genius work that he did in a piece we he, we, he published, uh, we at Zellman published. Uh, in Fantastic a, a summer, piece, by the way. It's, you know, cradle to grave on the demographics, yeah. which are quite sobering. But a lot of what I hear to counter the concern is the um, fact that we have so much wealth creation by uh, senior boomer Xers that are really supporting and supplementing their, um, you know, adult children's down payment, you know, the amount of um, gains from the stock market, cryptocurrency gains, uh, Redfin came out and said 25% of buyers in 2021 used their stimulus checks for down payment, I saw that, you know, yeah. and, and obviously those, that, that, Go, that's going away, but there was also cryptocurrency gains. And so that's one counter argument that there's wealth transfer of wealth. And then you have the migration. So in Scottsdale, when we had this round table, you know, builders that are move up high end said, you know, 40 to 50% of our buyers are from out of state. And given it was Arizona, they were saying from California, Washington, predominantly, whether you're in Texas and any of the Texas MSAs, they're coming from 
you know, California, they're coming from Washington as well. But that number had been prior to COVID, they estimate 20%. And there's so much um, of the market dynamic that incrementally that you see from non-primary where you're seeing cash buyers accelerating while those getting a mortgage are declining. So I think that the market, and, and I go and I look at markets like in Toronto or where markets where there's been investors have been really the predominant um, incremental growth that's supporting you know, this robust pricing. This could go on longer. The one thing different in the US, and, and Dennis can speak to this more, is that we are adding supply. You know, the amount of supply that we have, it's just not there yet. It's kind of feels yeah. like the boy who cried wolf. You know, we keep saying we've yeah. got record multifamily backlog. We've got single family backlog at the highest level it's been since 06. And well, you know, the guys around the builders around the room in Scottsdale were like, well, we can't get any homes completed. So I don't know how that's going to change because we don't have plumbers. We don't have roofers. We don't have HVAC. They're all aging out and we don't, you know, we're so constrained. So I think the dynamics of the market are really giving people a, a false sense of, of security that this, this is going to be sustainable. And in the near term, you know, there may be continued price appreciation for longer, even with rates rising. You know, if you could sell a, a home in, let's say, Pasadena for $1,000 um, a square foot, and, and then you move to, you know, let's say Phoenix, and it's 600 a square foot, um, do, do you really care if mortgage rates are up, you know, 100, 150 basis points? And, and by the way, don't worry about gas prices, because, you know, if you're moving to the desert or Inland Empire, or Palm Springs, you're working remote. So you don't have to worry about gas prices because people drive to qualify. So I hear every counter to yeah. my, you know, headwind of concern that people are just shrugging off as an issue. And I said, yeah, but they still have to buy groceries and, and they still have to pay for higher shelter. We have double digit rent inflation on new leases and high renewal, high single digit renewal. So it's, it's coming at every aspect from inflation. And so I think it's really difficult to just assume it's going to continue to rage, but institutional investors, they're, they're, they are looking to add more capital and looking for opportunities because the Fed has pumped so much liquidity into the market that residential real estate is the darling. And, and I, we, we could talk about that for hours about yeah, the yeah. amount of capital coming into the market. So I just want to, so there's a lot of cross currents and we're, we're talking about house prices and growth and where it's, where they're headed. And there's, Negatives and positives, obviously. Very complex. It feels, again, it feels like Alice in Wonderland to me. But it, it, before we go on to the investor part of the equation, because I'm a little confused by that as well, what's going on there. What What is your view then? I mean, I, I, you know, will house prices grow? Do you still think it's 4% per annum, you know, over the next couple, three years? Which, by the way, would be kind of the average house price growth since the beginning of time. So that's not really consistent with the idea that the market's going to run into some trouble. That seems like kind of, you know, down the middle of the fairway. Is that your view or is it price growth goes flat or, you know, what, what is your thinking here? Well, uh, I'll let my, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, let me, um, I'm going to give, make this an easy one for you. I'll, okay. I'll introduce my, my, my stat, my number for you, because it feeds into this. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, we were stat. going to go back to the game. Yep. Okay. So it's 294,000. 294,000. It sounds like a price of a home, but that is that is not the median price is three fifty. I think. No. Two, not, is it the price I, I of a home? I, should, I don't think I should guess because I I feel like I, I have a unit little number, not a price. I'll give you that. Say that again. The unit number, not a price. Two hundred and ninety four thousand. Is that um, units authorized but not started? No, but you're on the right track, Chris. Okay. Uh, units that were authorized but not well. I know there's one point. 6 million homes under construction, half of which are single, half of roughly half are multi. So that's not it. Yeah, but you're on the right track too, Mark. You guys are getting there. Uh, I don't know. What is the 294? Is that spec building? It's the number of kind it, of- it's, it's the increase in what's under construction over the last year. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Now that borders on a little yeah. too hard. I'm just saying, yeah. Dennis. Well, I realized after the 70 that maybe my number was a little hard, but the reason I bring, the reason I brought it up and, and and why I'm focused on it is because that's how much was added to backlog in the last year. That's equivalent to what was added to backlog of what's under construction the last five years combined. 
And mind you, the, the last five years were not bad housing years, right? So what Ivy's kind of speaking to, and, and I think what it's one of those data points that almost feels like in three years, four years time, people look back and, and say, oh yeah, it was obvious. I mean, look at how many homes people started and yeah, was yeah. under construction. <laughs> That's right. And and it's it's a number, and it's not even just the last five years. That's like the second highest number. You got to go back to the early 80s to find anything close. So you have all this, you mentioned earlier, the demand response is immediate, right? The pandemic brought about an immediate demand response alongside mortgage rates. The supply response hasn't happened yet. It, it takes too much time, especially when uh, in a, the builders literally stopped starting homes in March and April of 2020. And it took some time to get back to any type of <laughs> inventory. You could argue they, they still haven't gotten back there. So, and, and that's not the peak of it because the capital flowing in from every angle, multifamily developers, builder land investments, single family for rent, that number is only going to go higher. And, and I think when, we, when, we're, when we're sort of triangulating that with demand and thinking about price, we know that that's the cyclical component of the market, right? You guys know as well as we do that the, the demographics don't move that fast. You, you, you want to be on top of them. You want to understand the story of it. But year to year, the, the growth in the population, even in a good year, right, is... 1%. The number of bodies in our country, that's not swinging around all that much and how people behave doesn't swing around as dramatically as people want to imply. So this is all about supply. And if the supply mountain that's coming over the next 18 months is more than we can demographically support, then what do you think home builders are going to do to clear that inventory? Okay, Dennis, I'm going to pin you down, baby. You got to, everything you're saying to me says price declines is yeah. what you're think, saying to me but are you saying you price, price declines? i think you see price declines i think it's going to take some time because of right now builders are pushing price to cost you know they're not pushing price to affordability they're not matching it up with incomes they're looking at it and saying my demand is infinite so I'll, I'll raise price to cover my costs even though they've always told us that that's not how you price a home but that's what's happening so i think in the near term you see prices go up but i think you got this compounding effect where you're going to have to see prices go negative and again, in, in, in hindsight, in a couple of years, we'll sit there and say home prices went up 30% in two-year period, mortgage rates were higher, and you had a bunch of supply coming. Why is it a surprise? I am totally with you. I am totally yeah. with you. I'm totally with you. And our, you know, our forecast has it coming right down to zero, but not actually going negative, because I'll give you, this is the reason why. Because the minute you say negative, Mark, that's the headline. Mark Zandi says that home prices are going negative. Well, yeah, it's then a, I'll get a, vilified. It's, it's, it's a trigger point. Well, but you guys, what you need to remember is that the supply is highly concentrated, and therefore uh, we could have corrections that are more pronounced where the supply is the yeah, greatest. And point. I think that's what we need to focus on because yeah. you know nationally, it may not go negative because in Ohio and um, your state of great state of Pennsylvania, we don't have the same magnitude of supply. When we look at the one thing we haven't talked about yet, at least within the inflationary component is land prices. So we do a quarterly land development survey and land prices at the end of the fourth quarter, lot finished lot prices were up, you know, 35% year over year and, and that's national. And that looks like a hockey stick from where it had been over the prior period, five plus years. So when we look at lot prices and the land grab, um, it's, it's very disconcerting to assume that the builder is going to be able to sustain profitability unless they can just continue to pass it on to the consumer. And they have been. And that's one of Dennis's point. They're not writing, they're not pricing to affordability. They're pricing to cover those costs, land being the biggest. And so recognizing a finished lot as a percent of the cost of goods sold is half of the cost. So you can spend a lot even on lumber, which is the thing you hear mostly from builders whining and complaining. But land, if you buy the land wrong, that's going to be what ultimately yeah. determines what they do on pricing. And then they have to blow out these, these homes that they're specking. And I don't think that's going to happen in Ohio. I was uh, speaking at the University of Wisconsin this past summer, talked to some private builders there, and land prices are up maybe 10, 15%. So, and there's no real public builders there. I think Lennar was just entering the market at that time. So I think we have to think about the concentration and no surprise. Smile states, sand states. I heard a new term, banana states, from a building product distributor. Um, so, however, we want to formulate our thoughts. It's yeah. is it a surprise that Austin's strong? That's where all the builders are going. Or is yeah. it a surprise that Boise now is a new hot market and the builders are entering those markets? Why the, you know, private builders that have been there for you know decades are saying, I would never pay for that land. Or is it surprising that the, 
you know, build for rent uh, capital is going to Arizona and to Texas or Florida and following where they believe the growth is the strongest. So I think it's it's not national numbers I think about. I think it's about understanding where the supply is going, it, not only to be significantly higher, but also where within the market, because they have to go further out to the tertiary markets in order to even come close to penciling a return that they're promising their not their own capital, their, their, their investors that they've raised money with. And you hear from the land developers that it's a lot of dumb money. And there's new, new people into the market, new, new, new players on the chessboard that are, me, are driving a lot of the growth. Let me, let me uh, and I am going to come back to house price. And I'm just, for two things. We're going to come back to the game. And Ivy, you're going to go. I'm going to give you a chance to play the game. And then at the end, I'm going to ask for an explicit house price forecast for the next couple, three years. And I'm curious. We have to, we have to, we have to do it after our macro forecast because we're in the uh, No, no, no. This, this is a preview of, the, of that, a preview of that. <laughs> So, uh, and I'm going to tell you what our forecast is and what I, and you can say, this is our forecast, but, you know, I think it's to, you know, it's going to be less than that or more than that, where the risks are. But let's go back to investors for a second. I'm, this is confusing to me because if you, so we have all these um, institutional, well, we got all kinds of investors coming in. The latest data, we get transaction level data. We calculate the number of investors based on, you know, on the deed who's, you know, who has a corporate kind of a name. In a, you know, roughly a quarter of the sales now are to investors, and that's up a lot, you know, maybe 10 percentage points over the past year. Some of that is it, the, the increase in flipping hasn't really, it's not flipping per se. That remains about, you know, 5, 10 percent of the market nationwide. It's up in some markets like the Boise and the Phoenix, but not many markets. Most of it's institutionals, and I think it's, mo and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it's mostly, you know, I'm going to buy it or rent. But the question is, at these prices, you know, I've done some pro formas too, because I'm a kind of a mom and pop investor. So I go into, you know, uh, into Phil, Phil my, and my son does this. He goes into Philadelphia, buys old housing stock, rehabs and renovates, and then rents. And he's been doing this for a number of years. So I look at a lot of the, you know, the, the spreadsheets and I can see what the returns, the cash returns on based on ex expected rents. And they're, you know, pretty good. It's hard to pencil it out, I, on, at least on a cash on cash basis. You can't pencil it out. So then you're thinking oh, they got to be relying on capital gain. But does that make any sense at these kind of high prices and what we were just saying about? So my question to you is, what what are they doing? Is it is it? I mean, just because they have the cash, they're deploying it. So it really is dumb money. I mean, what what's going on? I, I can't figure that out. Or is my arithmetic wrong? Well, in, in the markets um, where you know they're building as opposed to renovating, you know, I think that you can make assumptions about future um, values that can, you know, be you arguably there. wrong and, yeah. and therefore you can make the numbers work. You also can assume you're going to get, you know, strong leasing once you're, you know, the level of lease rates that you're underwriting with the HPA, you'll, you'll um, benefit from but I don't necessarily think it's all dumb money. I think there's, you know, been probably some pretty significant returns already realized oh, on yeah. guys that have been doing it for a number of years. Yeah. And I don't believe that the institutional investors are really the lion's share of the, at least on the existing stock. Um, uh -huh. I think it's much more still individual investors and short-term <laughs> rentals. You know, I was out to dinner last night with an industry executive and him and his wife own um, several homes in um, inland desert area, California, Palm, Palm, Palm Springs. They have a condo in Mammoth. You know, you think about co-primary, second home, few investment properties, using short-term rental to cash, you know, supplement your income. There, there's such a significant amount of private investors. I was at dinner with a builder in DC in December, and he said, yeah, we probably sell about 20% of our homes to private investors. And these private investors are not flippers, so he's not worried. Yeah. Um, they're just buying to um, rent out. And and what we always come back to is that you know at some point you know do we do we have a people problem? But Dennis can weigh in more as our you know thoughts are aligned. You know we we are always challenging ourselves because this can last a lot longer. When you think about you know what, tell me where rates you know Chris will be two years from now, you know, and are we going to go into recession because the Fed's been so behind the curve and they're going to tighten as and a result of their tightening, we, we roll over into recession. 
and rates actually go back down and that the only place that people can hide is in real estate. You know, there's so many variables that we can't tell you what it's going to be like in, in three years, but the dynamics of supply and demand intersecting to Dennis's point, if supply does come to fruition and, and you know, these builders in, in Scottsdale is just an example of, of the rest of the country where supply is so constrained, they just don't see any way it's going to change. They're not going to all of a sudden miraculously have more trades, uh, more bodies at these various trades, and they don't understand how the municipalities are going to hire, you know, a staff that's normally two, or sorry, six, and now is only two. You know, kids straight out of college that have worked there for one day are, are, are working at these municipalities, and, you know, there just feels like there's impediments and and that's their pushback so you know, well, the and, the, and the view is not so much even that it's um supply it depends how you want to define supply i was talking about the ability to get homes completed and on the ground but the the underlying premise that's supporting the thesis for anyone who you know on the institutional level and i think this is the narrative in the media supporting the, the individual investor is that you have a housing shortage across the country that supply is, forget what's in backlog, that there's three, four, five, six, I've seen 8 million type shortages of number of houses that the country needs that it doesn't have. So the perception is that um, you've got this big tailwind from the millennials, which is misfounded, and you've got a shortage of housing. Yeah, but so that, why, not be, that, why not be the best place to invest? And, and the way you get there on on higher prices is to model more aggressive rent growth. Mark, you got to change your Excel model okay. and model a little bit more rent growth from these yeah. historic peaks. That's what it is. I mean, it's got to be because uh, you know I, if I put in strong rent growth in the Excel sheet, I mean, I'm talking the strongest rent growth <laughs> ever seen. I'm still not getting. I'm getting kind of maybe five percent cash on cash returns. Which so, you oh, know, it's okay, but you know, for the risk you're taking, I mean, it just feels like this is, and and we're we're you know, obviously supply is picking up, and then I would argue if you like a total new supply now, it, we're at 1.8 million, 1.9 million, including manufactured housing, that is no less than maybe now more than underlying demand for new housing. So vacancy yeah. rates are about ready to turn. They're going to bottom out here, and they're going to start to turn and move in the other direction. So you at you look at all that and you go, does this doesn't make sense what's happening now in terms of at least increasingly makes less sense from an investor perspective. That's right. It's, it sounds like you like what you're saying too. And yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think what you're, what you're really talking about, and I think we're talking about in, in aggregate with a lot of these things is, is just where are we on the risk tolerance uh, spectrum yeah. right now? And I yeah. think there is a lot of investors, private uh, individuals and institutions that believe that the risk is low for those reasons we mentioned. I think what we're looking at from more of an unbiased perspective, and it sounds like you share that view, is that the implied risk seems quite high. Yeah, And you see. might very well be right, we might very well be wrong, but I think there's a lot of underlying data and a lot of yellow flags that we've been talking about that leave us much more cautious. And as Ivy said, we're skeptics at heart. It's I, I think we'd be bad analysts if we weren't, but we tend to lean pretty heavily on what the data is saying. And I think the data is leading us to a lot of these conclusions. and. Um, some of the things that were very evident with hindsight last cycle, yeah, I think people are looking for that same mortgage driven excess. It's not going to be there. It's, it's no. something else. And those something else's are starting to add up quite a bit. And to Ivy's point, it can last longer than it should, but it feels like you're at the point in the cycle where every step higher that it's going just kind of means the other side's going to fall a little harder. I like, I like that metaphor. So, so Ivy, Ivy. We're going to play the game. You got to play the game. Are, are you ready? You ready with your statistic? I was going to provide you a statistic. I was just going to also say, you know, to, to Dennis's point, um, just talking to a um, C-suite executive that runs about 10,000 unit portfolio of multifamily assets. He said, I used to do cartwheels if we were getting four to 5% rent growth. Yeah. So now I'm doing backflip and uh, triple cartwheels because I'm getting 16% on new leases and 12% on renewals. And, and if you're underwriting a new development for multifamily and that's the input that you're utilizing, yeah. that return is gonna look a lot better than if you go back in pre-COVID, the cartwheel, uh, you know, two to four was a good annualized rate for rent growth. And by the way, the Fed doesn't incorporate what current, you know, in their PCE and, and thinking yeah. about shelter that's not showing up today in CPI 
and, and, and Dennis can speak more to that. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of assumptions that rent rolls are going to be sustainable because Dennis's earlier point, we have a shortage. There's no, there's no shelter and there's a huge deficit. All right. So my number for yep. you, uh, it's an easy one. I think we'll see, mm. uh, 5 trillion. 5 trillion, well, that's the amount of fiscal stimulus provided to the economy during the pandemic. No, okay. That's not well, the one I'm thinking. That is, that is 5 that's, trillion though. No, I know, that's not the 5 trillion I'm thinking about. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, trillion, increase in housing wealth, so. Increase Bravo. in housing wealth? Correct. Over the past year? Over the pandemic. Two years, okay. Two years with inclusive of those that don't have a mortgage, which is about 35% of, of homeowners. Oh, that, that's that's a good statistic. I think it's three point two trillion without uh, for those who just have a mortgage. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, someone was telling me, and I I haven't been able to confirm this, and we mentioned it uh, in a different context earlier that people are cashing out now to finance future additional purchases. That a lot of the investors are now using the 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 built up equity in their previous purchases to buy new homes you know additional homes huh. have you run across that have you seen anything any that feels sort of untoward to me like a, a sign of froth you know when people start doing that kind of thing has that run across your radar screen at all i haven't heard that specifically but i wouldn't not. be surprised by it at all that yeah. feels like 2006. That does feel a little weird. well i think people have more than doubled their the, the, the couple i had dinner last night with um they basically bought two years ago in, in Palm Springs and they've more than doubled um, their investment. And you know, today it feels pretty good owning it. So unless you have challenges on the carry costs and you start to say, you know, my um, overall expenses are rising and it takes a lot more um, cash flow to pay the property taxes that are rising and just the overall utilities and every aspect of carrying more than one home and it's not your day job, like your, you know, son is is you know doing fix and flip or or renting rentals. I think people might start to say, I should take some chips off the table, but we haven't really seen or heard of that much. Although inventories did sequentially in the NAR report today, we did see inventories tick modestly higher, but inventories are at a, at least as a percent of households are at you know predominantly all time record lows, and I just revert back to well, what did it look like? before the pandemic. And it was all also at all time record lows. And people would say to me, why is housing so lackluster? Why are, why are home prices not rising more, even though inventories are so tight? And we can go through all the reasons, but it, at that point, you know, that, that was more me providing people are aging in place. You know, people yeah. are locked in at a low rate. Landlords like their cash on cash return. So try to explain why housing wasn't stronger, but now, it's all about, well, inventories are so tight, there's no housing. So that's why home prices are, are up massively, but home prices are up massively because the velocity, historically velocity defined as those homes available for sale at the end of a month and then sold in the subsequent 30 days, historically call it roughly 20% of the 30 days those, those homes would sell. The last data point, I'm not sure what the NAR today, but it was approaching 60%. Mm -hmm. And so they're turning so much faster <laughs> And how much of that is, to your point, investors that are you know selling and taking profits? Mm -hmm. um, but we're we're you know watching that velocity very closely. But I think if we want to nail down our home price forecast, yeah, you know I would say that it's so contingent on when the supply comes to market and what the economic backdrop would be. But I would guess that right now this is going to go longer, and there'll be an upward bias in the near term to our pricing forecast just because we the momentum is so strong. Yeah. And, and I think it's like an ocean freight, you know, you, yeah. you can't turn the tide that quickly. I think the consumer is sort of brushing off the war and, you know, the tightening, you know, isn't, you know, it's just beginning. So main street versus wall street, you know, wall street investors, the capital, they, they're not even taking a breath. No. There's no stopping them. Yeah. And, and they want to give more capital and they want to buy more and there's land banking going on and there's just a tremendous amount of optimism that's not deterred at all by what's happening from fed policy or from the war at least my little anecdotes and being out in southern california marketing and visiting with investors that are very large investors and very active not only 
with institutional capital, but also on the land banking side. So I, I, I think it's um, probably goes longer, but um, Dennis, you might want to weigh in. It's just, it's, it's uh, fascinating right well, now to be, this, to be, in, to... To be uh, where we are in, in the analysis part of the game. Let's do this. Two things. One, Chris and I have a bet, and I want to get your take on the bet. Uh, and then second, maybe just to make it concrete, we're, 2022 is hard to talk about house price, Chris, because you're right. I mean, you're coming into the year at 20% year over year. So no matter how you do the calculation, based on the arithmetic, it's going to be a strong year. I mean, even if it slows dramatically by year's end, you're still going to get a potentially a double-digit game for 2022. So let's look into 2023. And I'm going to go to Chris first. Chris, what do you think 2023 HPI growth, house price growth, is going to be? And let's say the core logic HPI series that controls for mix, and it's the entire market, not just you know the conforming market or non-conforming. It's the entire market. What do you think house price growth will be? And you can give a range too. You know, can however I, you want to characterize. Can I, can I also add on to that? Is are you do you do you when you ask the question, are you thinking what the average through the year, or point to point, like end of uh, end of the year? I, I that I was going to say that, then I thought it was too 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 much, but because precision is good. I was going to say Q4 to Q4, Q4 2022 to Q4 2023, not calendar year, you know, because you can yeah. have that, you know, that effect right. that Ivy's talking about. I, I'm trying to, you see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to get to your underlying sense of where house price growth is headed. So Chris, what, what is your, what is Q4 2022 to Q4 2023 house price growth? Or and again, I'd characterize say. it any way you like, you know, range, Upside, downside. I'm just, you know, I want to get a sense of what you really think is going to the world's going to look like in 2023. Yeah, so I, I think two to four uh, percent. We might guess for this year. We're, I think we're, we have to update our forecast, make it a little bit stronger. I think there's going to be a last gasp as people see the hot, higher rates. Um, but then I do expect to see the rates really biting towards the end of this year and into 23. Two, two to four percent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, downside so just, or upside risk. Uh, downside. Downside risk. Okay. Uh, Ivy Dennis, who wants to go next? And you don't have to go if you don't want to. I'm just. No, I, I'll I'll frame it in a way that obviously we are we're in the middle of ours as well, so we can't front run it. But where we were before was modestly negative for existing in Ooh. 23, and that's point okay. to point. And we were a couple points negative for new, where the builders would they're they're more likely to incentivize clear price, and that's an inclusive of incentives and so forth. Um, I think to Ivy's point, the momentum in the near term is stronger than where we were before. Yeah. And I'm not sure that that necessarily means that we would look at 23 with more optimism. Um, I think it, we're also going to introduce 24. So there's kind of that element to it. But I would say I'd be more likely to see it minus two than a plus two. Got it. Got it. Ivy, mm -hmm. what would you what would you say? Yeah, I was going to say um, with it accelerating more than we um, modeled for 22, you know, the, the uh, stronger the climb up, the more likely the, the decline down. So, you know, the, the, the more we keep pushing on the gas. So, you know, I'd probably be in the low single digits um, from that 2% that Dennis pointed to. It seems reasonable. I, I think the, the risk would be that, you know, um, it, it's not as quickly uh, materializing for various reasons, but I do think that there's going to be more a, like a even a mid single, you know, three to four plus, and in in at least maybe more in areas where the supply is just massive. So I think nationally, 2% down sounds pretty reasonable. The funny part to me, Mark, is when you have this conversation with clients or people in general, they're like, you actually think house prices could go down? Yeah. You know, almost like a negative number. Like it is never happened. Tail risk, a tail risk event. Yeah. And, right. and you, you, you kind of look at it and you say, let's go back to our fourth quarter 19 outlook look at where the trend line is yeah. what where is it now and, and we're we're, we're kind of haircutting here two percent three percent you'd still yeah. be up what 25 30 percent from where you were you know pretty pretty sizable gains to begin with so um i think everyone's always a little cautious to throw that negative number out there but where you're left is is not that bearish of a scenario from where you would have thought uh 23 would be in 19. I, I'm with you guys. I, I think it's going to be negative, no doubt about it. In, in fact, uh, the only reason why it might not be is because no one's going to sell their home. They all think, everyone's going to think, oh, my home is worth $1.3 because that's what Zillow says it is today, and I'm not selling for less than $1.3 So the, the, 
the actual price, you know, the shadow price, if you had to transact, as an economist would say, would be firmly negative, but the actual measured price may not because you'll get 4.5 million existing home sales because no one's going to transact. That, that may be what happens. Well, you also have people that are actually going to get foreclosed and we see delinquencies rising and subprime mortgage. So you start to, well, that, you know, you that's start a different to see, scenario though. That would you know, be real big time price declines, right? Well, that, the, 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 the amount today is fairly negligible. I mean, the, the people that are in forbearance, you know, have been steadily declining as the mortgage services are working hard to keep them in their homes. Um, there's so much startup capital that VC backed that, have been in the market sort of facilitating a lot of the purchases for SFR, like the iBuyers, you know, they don't want to say how much they're selling even in escrow to SFR. But, you know, when you think about the magnitude of the co-primary, you mentioned like people aren't going to want to sell their home because they've made so much money and they'll just think it's going to go up because Zillow says it's X value. But if you're carrying multiple homes or you're assuming your short-term rentals are going to keep generating um, incremental income for you and all of a sudden they don't, I think that we're going to see that this non-primary piece of the market might even be bigger than your 25% of what transactions. And, you know, it's just, it feels like, you know, I asked an audience, you know, raise your hand um, in Southern California, I presented to a group, probably about hundred people, raise your hand if you have a, a, another home besides the one you live in. And very few raised their hand. I was surprised because I think that, you know, cocktail chatter, it feels like everybody that I talk to, maybe it's just the, the, you know, Wall Street crowd, but there's a lot of people that have more than one unit and do they start to get, you know, nervous because the ocean freight changes direction on the, on the, you know, ocean, you, you start to get some waves and they said, oh, you know what, I better lock in that, those gains. And that, that tide can change very quickly. Yeah. And, you know, certainly our job, is to provide, provide you insights. But the nice part about what we do that's so differentiated is that we're able to get real time um, perspective from people that are in the field operating daily. And you know, I sent around to our team, one of our industry executives that's in Austin and, and pretty much the Southwest, but he's based in Austin. And he's, he was showing us that a builder was um, offering incentives in San Antonio to close homes. And we didn't understand it, the mortgage rate buy downs. And, and wait a minute, I thought the market was off the charts, robust. Why, why would a builder have to give you buy downs or pay closing costs? I think it was actually. So we're, we're just not sure how much of that non-primary starts to diminish resulting in inventories lifting and everybody, why are inventories rising? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, so, I hear you. Hey, um, I, I know we're running out of time, and I know Ivy, you have a, another uh, appointment to go to. But uh, and there's like a gazillion things I wanted to ask you. Uh, maybe we can have you back if you're if you're game for it. But Absolutely. I do have a question. Uh, your background? It's uh, that's the Empire State Building. Is that the sun setting or the sun rising? It feels like <laughs> it should be the sun setting. Given this conversation, but I think it's the sun rising, isn't it? If I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking east, aren't I? Or have you guys even thought about this? With the Definitely background? not thought about that. <laughs> I was going to say, ask Dennis. Somebody, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, somebody in marketing. Are we sure the sun even comes from that direction? It might just make it look nice. Yeah. This well, anyway, is, uh, rising, I think it's sun, huh? I think it's sunrise, uh, sun rising. That would be yeah. apropos, I think. So but apropos. Certainly on you guys. You guys are fantastic, and I really want to thank you for taking uh, this time with us. And um, Chris is going to be wrong, guys. I can feel it, you know, this house price forecast of his. I'm going to have to work on him. Yeah. So anyway. You're coming around, Mark. It's uh, better to be an optimist. Um, uh, that you, have is more, true. you have more fans. You know, I, fans. I think that I've been called perma bear, jihad, number of uh, names, wow. poison, poison ivy. And oh, that's, um, that's eventually. Good laughing. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh at that. No, it's okay. I, I've got thick skin, but um, yeah. you know, fortunately, we, we have a very good uh, team that we collaborate and we're always questioning ourselves. And, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, we just are, you know, providing people a perspective that's admittedly contrarian, sobering, and they really don't want to hear it. I, I always go back to the days of uh, 2005 and think about you know, so many people that would say, you know, thank you for making, 
for us to stop and think about, you know, some of the things that were concerning back then, had you not, I wouldn't be here today. And, and that's the most rewarding thing that we can really ever look back on and that we were able to help others. And so I think that we just want to continue to provide those insights and, and always um, being thoughtful and challenging ourselves. Every day we challenge ourselves and we talk amongst ourselves and we, we have a very strong team. And so we'd be, we'd be honored to come back and, and share with you, you know, what, what the latest and greatest is, but um, the paid warriors uh, either do us well or uh, will be wrong, but, you know, certainly, you know, the information we're providing, it does, does make people stop and think. I always get questions after I present, can I see your slides? Can I can I dig in deeper? So people do, you know, those that are um, thinking about putting capital work, they, they want to know, but they don't want to know. You know, it's kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah, but you guys, you know, you do it. So, you do it in such a nice way. You know, uh, it's easily <laughs> digestible, you. very readable, fun to listen to, and and I'll have to say, um, uh, often right. So uh, and you. I and and I and I'm I'm on board with you guys. I'm with you. I think. I think there's a day of reckoning coming, probably not this year, that yep. freight train, as you talk about, or that, that freighter has got a moot turn, but 2023, 2024 feels like, I don't know, it feels like we're setting us up for, for a correction. But anyway, with that, we're going to call it a podcast. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, listening in. Talk to you next week.